on a passage which basically has had a big influence in my life and it's really shaped me, it's really precious to me in many ways and so I thought I would just share about that this morning if that's okay. Um, it's about uh, the church and so I want you to try and do a thought experiment with me. If you can, use your imagination, really stretch it. Can you imagine a world where you weren't allowed to meet together on a Sunday? I know it's hard to do. Try that. Try and imagine a world where you couldn't meet together on a Sunday. What would you be missing out on? Obviously, you know what that's like. I'm being a bit silly. I've done it for the last two years. Because you could, there was lots of conversation around that time. You could say, well, you know what? It, worship time? You can put on your favourite, I'm going to say CD, you don't listen to CD, you still like, whatever, like whatever worship songs you like to listen to, you can just stream that at home. Turn up the volume so it feels like you're in church. Just do that in the kitchen, can't you? That's church. Then, oh, I need a sermon, so you can just go on the internet. You can find any sermon you want. You know, you get your drum life, and you go, I'm in church, aren't I? And obviously, I'm being a bit silly, and we all know that's the case. But the point is, there's been lots of discussion in the last sort of few years about what we do together when we meet and why we do it. And I just think there's a really important passage of the Bible in Hebrews which helps us with what we're meant to be doing when we meet together. It's the clearest part of the Bible where it says you need to meet together, but importantly, it gives you the why you meet together. So in the book of Hebrews, and it's Hebrews chapter 10, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, if you turn to it, it be helpful to have it in front of you. But Hebrews is a letter in the New Testament, it's an epistle, it's written to a church, and basically the writer of the letter, he's like um, a sports coach, who is really yelling at the sidelines of the church saying, come on, keep going. I know there are many things in your life which are hard, but don't drop out. And he's yelling at them at different reasons why they need to keep going. And the particular section we're at is in chapter 10. He began it in chapter 4, where he talks about what God has revealed in Jesus, to how they used to have sacrifices in the temple. If you're familiar with the Old Testament of the Bible, that's how they used to have access to God was through killing animals and worship with blood and getting into a temple and you could come closer to God. And he's saying, that's done away with now because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Now you have access to God. And he said, this should be a thrilling thing. And so we come to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. He says, because of what Jesus has accomplished for you, it's like you're entering into the temple. He says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, because therefore we have these things, here's some application for you, church. Firstly, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He says, let us hold fast the confidence of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And he says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this is the the author who's like this coach, and he's encouraging them from the sidelines. Here is the reality of the access to God that you have through Jesus. And he's saying, and in your spiritual life, there is a risk that you will drop out. So don't drop out, keep going, and in fact, even when it gets harder, you will need to meet together, you need to fight to do it more and more. And in verses 22 and 23, if you look at it, it says, you, you consider yourself, don't you? You think about yourself. You think about your own spiritual walk. He says, with a true heart and full of, we need to draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast to our confession. He talks about ourselves. Now, hopefully, many of us are familiar with this responsibility for our own spiritual walk. And in fact, a little bit was shared this morning, wasn't it, about making sure that we call God Lord and in our own personal lives take time be with him. And we should know in some way how to take care of our own hearts to keep going. 
If you feel in your own Christian walk a bit dry, a bit dull. So, you know, there's certain things you should be doing. You remember the gospel truths that we've remembered and the communion and things like that we've sung about. And maybe, you know, you need a period of prayer and fasting. Maybe it is a case of just putting on some music and having a time of praise and worship. Maybe it's getting down and reading some devotional things. Some people like Christian poetry, it's not me, but, you know, that really helps them go on in the Christian faith. Or sermons, good old sermons, that'll keep you going, won't it? Listen to some sermons, that's what I like, sermons are good. But whatever it is, it brings you to that place where you can draw near to God, and as the writer saying, have that confidence and that relationship with Him. And we know that for us, hopefully. But what's important for us this morning is how we consider other people. It says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but by encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And that's really what I want us to think about for a moment now, okay? I'm just going to break down those verses. We're just going to go through those verses and think about what he's saying to us. Firstly, he says, let us consider how. This is not something that's just going to happen by default. It's not just going to happen if you just, oh, we're just going to meet together, maybe it'll be fine. It's a, no, he says, get thinking. Apply yourselves to this. Get creative. It's not going to be something where you just go, here's a booklet, and here's how to do it. Here's a, here's a leaflet with a list of things to do. You need to start thinking about how to do this. To do what? Get thinking about how to stir up one another. So ideally, the idea in there is, it's, it's the, the word is actually like, provoke one another. Like in other parts of the Bible, it's like poking people, like winding them up. You really want to stir people up. And importantly again, it says, one another. It doesn't say elders of your church, or home group leaders, or somebody's in charge of youth ministry. It's one another, isn't it? This is, we all have a part to play. It's what we call in the Bible, fellowship. Okay? We have one another need to do this. To what? To love and good works. We need to meet together and stir one another up. Not just have a nice friendly social time, because we want to see fruitfulness in each other's lives. And this is important because of the context of the book we're saying, keep going in your Christian race. Keep going. Part of the way we keep going as Christians is to be busy with love and good work, be active in the Christian life. That's one of the ways you keep running the race according to this part of the Bible. So we need this, each one of us. And how we make this happen? Or what is the risk of this not happening? It says this, by not neglecting to meet together, encouraging one another, and all the more to see the day approaching. When we meet together, maybe on a Sunday, maybe home groups and things like that, but he's saying there needs to be like a sense of urgency. It says there's a day approaching. Now, when we say something why we meet together, thinking about you know, the initial questions I was getting to think about, we don't often have that sense of urgency of why we must meet together. And he says, because there is a day approaching that we need to be preparing. It doesn't say you meet together to worship, does it? It's not why we meet together according to this part of the Bible. We don't meet together to worship or to learn the ceremony. Well, that's part of it, certainly part of it. We need spurring on a sense of urgency. So, this passage is saying, as we consider ourselves in the Christian race, we need to consider each other. And when we think of fellowship, you know, we, we list off all the one another's that we love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, submit to one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. We need to gather together to spur on one another. And this is very helpful because it tells us why we need to meet together. Because if you ask somebody, what are you going to do? What do you think you should do? when Christians gather. People have lots of opinions about what should happen on a Sunday, or what shouldn't happen on a Sunday, or what shouldn't happen on a home group, or what shouldn't happen on a home group. The interesting thing is that, you know, the New Testament, if you open the Bible, 
I'm going to give you loads of rules about what you should be doing in the New Testament. It gives you some principles that things do decently and in order. But basically it's saying, you're, it gives you the goal. If you want to ask what you should be doing, it says, well, whatever leads to you stirring one another up and spurring one another on. That's your goal. Now, thankfully, usually we're spurred on and encouraged by in terms of praise and prayer and sermons and all that. So what we're doing basically makes sense. But the point is the Bible gives you the goal, not exactly what you should be doing when you meet together. So I just want to apply this to ourselves now, just as I've tried to apply it to my life, I was thinking, how can we apply this to ourselves? And I was thinking, for me, maybe the case for you as well, it's actually how we think about why and how we meet together. And this passage should change the way we think about it, and in two particular ways. It's going to give us two ways uh, where we can think about our motives and our reasons for doing this when we meet together. The first one is because of the heart of Jesus. See, the risk is, when we think about other people, when we see other people slow down in the Christian race, maybe we don't see as much love, maybe we don't see as much energy in doing good in the Christian life, we start to lose interest, we start to cool off a bit, what the Bible calls Luke, warm. Maybe they're discouraged, maybe they're struggling with doubt about God's love for them, about forgiveness. The risk is, we feel ourselves as the super spiritual ones. We're not like them. We end up looking down on people like that. You know, they're not taking this seriously. They clearly don't care. In the back of your mind, you think, well, where are they spiritually? Are they even a Christian? Are they even saved? Maybe they're just religious by name. And we need to fight that. The Bible is saying we need to fight that. If that's in our own minds and hearts, how does Jesus think about these people? Does Jesus just write people off when they start to be like that? No, the Bible shows us that Jesus is very concerned when people are like that. We have a whole picture, a wonderful picture of the, of the 99 sheep that are all fine, all good little religious people meeting and doing everything right. And there's one sheep that wanders away. What does Jesus do? His eyes go straight to that sheep. That's where his heart is. That was important to Jesus. And he goes and risks everything to find that one sheep. There's a church, and if you look in Revelation, it's part of the Bible, where they address different churches. And there is one church, it's got a funny name, Laodicea, and Jesus addresses them. and says, you know, some of you, you're lukewarm, you don't care. But Jesus doesn't say, well then, fine, get lost. If you don't care about me, I don't care about you. He says, repent, turn back. He says, those I love, I rebuke, and I want you to come back to me. Jesus' is heart is for people who want to already. He wants them drawn back. Jesus loves those people who are struggling. And so should we. And also I think it's very important maybe, you know, I'm not sure, I don't know everyone here, and if you're new to Christianity or just getting to know about Jesus, and remind you that the message of the Gospel isn't come and do some religious activities, come every Sunday and, and you have to do these things and maybe God will accept you because God wants you to work towards him and be pleasing to him. We have a gospel where Jesus looks at people who are wandering away, looks at people who have got away from him, and he pursues them. He wants them to turn back to him. The gospel is Jesus knows that you've messed up your life, and he comes and finds you, and he washes you, and he welcomes you back to himself. That's the heart of what we believe. That the message of Jesus is to do all these things, and maybe Jesus will receive you. It's, you have done all these wrong things. And Jesus is still going to come and find you and make you his. Yeah. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the heart of the gospel. And we need to have that in our hearts as well as we think about each other. And secondly, I just think this passage shows us we need to be thinking about the spiritual reality of these things. To have that sense of urgency. The passage said, as we see the day approaching. If we read the Bible, we know that's the language of this final day. It's the end of it all. When we know we need to make it to the end, we need to endure to the end to get over the finish line. 
And it looked like people in this church weren't going to make it to the end. And we need to keep each other from dropping out of the race. And he phrases this as a very serious situation. I'm going to read it again. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And let me continue reading. Because what follows are some of the weightiest words in the whole of God's scriptures. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses died without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by one who has trampled on the foot of the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the spiritual grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now those words and speak for themselves. But he is saying to identify as a follower of Jesus and then to slip away or to fall away puts you in a worse position. There's that sense of hopelessness, isn't there? Darkness, no light. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Fearful expectation of judgment. A fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we can wrestle with our understanding of these verses because they are heavy verses. But the important thing is, the writer includes himself in this warning. It's not some other group, he sent some people out there who need to be careful about this. And he uses this strong language deliberately because he says, we, the church, needs to take this warning seriously. In their day, as you read, you keep reading through this passage, you see that there are lots of pressures and persecutions that would be on them to stop meeting together and eventually drop out of the Christian race. And he wants them to hear this strong warning. And so it needs to be for us, doesn't it? There will be many pressures on us to stop meeting together, to stop identifying as a Christian. It would be much easier, maybe, in certain ways, to drift away. A lot easier to stop being a Christian. Or maybe just laziness, just oh, I can't be bothered, I can't, I don't want to be involved in things like that. It's a lot of effort. But when we see that in each other, we need to have that sense of responsibility for our brothers and sisters. We need to have this sense of urgency that this passage wants us to have. Not, it's not just, oh, I think they've got other things in their life now, all they change their views on certain things. This passage describes it as life and death, okay? We need to see it as life and death as well. So hopefully this passage helps us rethink a little bit about how we approach fellowship and meeting together and what we're doing and why. To have that sense of responsibility and that sense of urgency. But because it's the heart of Jesus who when he saw people wandering away came and pursued them. And just as I close, I know that this is put a strong sense of responsibility on people, which can feel a bit like a burden, maybe. Oh, this is a really burdeny part of the Bible. But I want us also to think about it as something beautiful that we can do for one another, something beautiful about our relationships with our brothers and sisters and what fellowship is. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about an illustration of something that I saw on the news, and it was from sport, and I know nothing about sport. And Richard Brooke was not here to correct me, so I'll get away with it. But I remember watching on the news, I think it was 2016, and there was a triathlon in Mexico. Now again, I have to look this up what a triathlon is, but basically you do lots and lots of physical exertion. You do swimming and cycling and running. And there were these two brothers, Johnny and Anister Brownlee, who were running in this race. Okay? And obviously they're very close, right coming up to the end, and one brother's called Johnny, and he was winning, he was coming first. And just as he comes around the corner, so one of the first parts of the, last parts of the race, basically, through exhaustion, 
his legs start to wobble, and sadly he starts to sort of collapse and start to go to the side of the, of the race bit, and people are kept, like, trying to support him and stuff like that, and he's really sad, obviously, because he was going to come first, and then he's, he's collapsed. And then, like, perfect movie timing, his brother, Alistair, comes around the corner, and without missing a beat, sees his brother start to tumble to the floor, doesn't do anything, just grabs him and puts his arm over his shoulder, and just limps with his brother. And he's just limping with his brother. And obviously, some other plonker overtook him and he came first, but who cares about the guy he took first? Because these two brothers limped and together came third in that race. And no one, no one knows about the guy who came first, but what we saw there is someone who said, that's my brother. And he's falling. And I don't care about what happens to me. Now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down and I'm going to get him. And I'm going to get him to finish line for my brother. It's really beautiful, isn't it, to see that family. That's what this church. Mm. And we're running along, and we're doing fine, maybe. And you see someone stumbling, that's your brother, that's your sister. You grab their arm, you put them over your shoulder, and you live together with them. Because mm-hmm. you know maybe one day you're going to start stumbling. And they're going to come pick you up. I think that's a wonderful picture of what Jesus has done when he's made his church, and he's brought us together with his people. That's what he's done. He's given you brothers and sisters to get you over that finish line. So maybe I'll just I'll, I'll pray and then have a go with him and that. Dear Jesus, we want to just say thank you for your love for us. As we are adopted into your family, you are described as all of our brother. And you have seen us in all of our failure and all of our mess, and you have come and picked us up, and you have washed us, and you carry us. And as you do that, you teach us how to treat one another. Lord God, please help us to see our brothers and sisters as precious in your sight, people who you love and you want them to keep going in the Christian faith. Help us to see the spiritual reality they face as they drop out. And help us to see how we can have a beautiful role in helping each other and spurring us on in the Christian life. As we head towards you and your glory and your joy that's set before. So in your name alone, we just ask for your grace and ask for you to transform our hearts and minds to have fellowship with one another. Amen. Amen.